First of all, let's define worry. There are many ways we could describe it. Worry is fear painting pictures in your mind. And if you watch that mental movie too long, you get a false picture of how things really are. Worry is a mental broadcasting station, and more often than not, it is false or at least distorted propaganda. Worry has that sneaky way of stopping short of giving you all the facts. Worry is often the trickery of mentally filtered facts on the negative side and the bold declaration that these are all the facts. Worry has the mental audacity to suggest that the elevator only runs one way, down. Many times worry is a five alarm bell for a wastebasket fire. And worry is a depletion of constructive emotion. It's wasted mental energy. It's like letting the starter run the battery down when the car won't start. And worry is most often a lack of all the facts, a lack of full understanding, a lack of total information, and an unpreparedness of ability, knowledge, talent, courage, faith, and all the other virtues. That should give us a better definition of worry, and remember, left unchecked, it can become like a mad dog loose in the house and the sorrow and pain and regret is too large a price to pay not to do something about it, and to do it now. You see, if you contemplated the total sum of human suffering long enough, it would drive you mad. You must understand how life is. Human suffering, man's inhumanity to man, war, disease, poverty. But it must be in what I call its rightful ratio of your mental and emotional time. So much for what worry is. The next question is, what can I do about it? What is the first step? My best advice on this is to first recognize worry for what it is, admit what it does, and then decide you now want to be free. It first starts with decision on your part. And may I add, well, you should decide. Why let worry continue to take money out of your pocket and bank account? Why let worry any longer keep you from becoming all you can be? Why let it rob you of better friendships, better business, better profits, better results, better communication, better family relations? Why impose your worry on others any longer? It's a burden you can get rid of and a monkey you can get off your back. Why not be rid of those sinking, nagging feelings that all is not going to be well, that you can't do it, that it won't work out for the best? Worry is undue concern that takes up too much of your mental and emotional time. Now, we must all be concerned. Hey, life is no joke except to the jokers. Life and how to live it is a serious matter. It is risky, full of peril, and there are constant threats to the good we want and to the pursuit of happiness. However, it is undue concern or concern that takes up too much mental time that begins the harm. It's like a family planning a wonderful trip. While they certainly should be concerned about the condition of the car, the tires, and making sure they pick the proper route, it would be foolish to allow themselves to be completely turned negative with the thought that they might crash and kill the entire family. If that were the case, even if they went, the entire trip would be turned into one nightmare of fear with the specter of chaos looming around every curve, rather than enjoying the wonderful trip they had planned for themselves and their family. A lot of people do that with their entire life. So, start to make these declarations. And if you mean it, they will start you on your way to confidence and adventure free of the worry habit. Say first, I've had it with worry. I'm tired of being beaten down and hassled with all those negative mental pictures. I refuse to be tricked by false facts. I'm really not that weak. Never again do I want those sick feelings inside, those mental false alarms. I'm tired of the drain on my resources. I'm tired of the embarrassment of the lack of confidence. 
I don't want people, especially my family, to see me in this state anymore. I've got more to offer. I refuse to let my life be short-circuited any longer by letting my mind run wild with a distorted view of the facts, whether I bring it up or if it comes from someone else. Prove it to yourself. Think back over all the things that you worried about, all the fantastic, catastrophic events that your well-meaning advisors had told you were going to happen. Be pleased that none of them ever happened to you, or else you would not be alive today. Ninety percent of the things you worry about never happen anyway. All of us have had these well-meaning advisors who want to appear larger in the eyes of those they wish to advise, and who immediately rear back and describe every single bad option they can think of that might possibly happen. By the time they have finished, the one who has come for some confidence and some help wonders why he even bothers to live anymore. And the fact is, those things are never really going to happen anyway. Bring to question now what your mind tells you or what others tell you and pledge not to go for false alarms. I've had it is a good beginning. This first step will start you arguing with your worry thoughts. Soon you will start to examine your fears and worries to see if they are valid and you won't let your mind play those mental tricks any longer. It is possible to destroy any emotion you have, including worry and fear, by a very simple process, and that is, analyze it to death. Drag it out on the table and look at it. Weigh it against all of your past experiences. Make sure this one can stand against all the past facts you have. You will now start to use worry instead of letting worry use you. It's a beginning being in control instead of out of control. You will now let concern and the first signs of worry prompt you to learn, ask questions, and look at all sides in order to evaluate true, positive, constructive action. Now you can say, I will let fear advise me of the facts, but I won't let fear tell me these are all the facts. Nor will I let fear determine my reaction to the facts. I will gladly take up the war of faith over doubt, reason over fear, and positive expectation over worry. So talk to yourself right now into a change of attitude. Be persuasive. Go all out. Show yourself the hell if you don't, and the good life of answers and progress if you do. Say to yourself, what a fantastic feeling it must be to stop the panic drain on my mental energy, emotion, and physical strength. Imagine putting all that saved energy and emotion and strength into my action plans for the good life. Hey, accept the challenge. Believe your beliefs. Doubt your doubts. Stay on the campaign to give worry a bad time. Like being your own conscientious judge, say, I've had it with the presentation of a one-sided story. I sustain the objection that worry has failed to bring out all the facts. I despise these mental courtroom maneuvers that try to belittle my client, me. I demand the whole truth. And if worry will not be silent, I may cite him for contempt of the court of reason. Call up that scene often when worry wants to hassle you with the same old tricks and the same old results. It will work every time. Okay, let's move on to some really positive steps. If you can survive all that has happened to you up to this moment in your life, in spite of doing and thinking many of the wrong things, imagine how you can succeed by now starting to do some of the right things. First, the best answer to worry is confidence, and confidence starts first with awareness. Here is one of the most important lessons in life to learn. Life and business is like the changing seasons, and the real challenge of life is to learn how to handle the winter and take advantage of the spring. In short, that's it. 
You see, winter always comes, but so does the spring. Night follows day, but also day follows night. Sure, the tide goes out, but it always comes in. Opportunity follows difficulty as surely as difficulty follows opportunity. I have written and recorded much on how to take advantage of the spring, how to cash in on life's opportunities, work hard all summer, learn more ways to plant and protect what you invest, and to reap in the fall without complaint knowing it's your harvest and you've reaped what you've sown. For this subject, however, let's talk about how to handle the winters, those times when worry like winter takes its heavy toll. So, we tell it like it is. Winter always comes. So does the night. Some happenings in our life will always be a cause for concern. And sometimes concern turns to worry, and worry turns to fear. But remember, that is to be expected. Each day, each event, each season, brings both expected and unexpected challenges that we must think about and make decisions on. Life is like a stream that flows continuously. The better we understand that, the better chance we have to produce good results out of all of our challenges. May I suggest something to you? I have a friend who is an avid skier. You know something? He can only ski in the wintertime. You can only hunt the elk when the snow falls in the high mountains and drives them down. That's called wintertime. You see, it's all right if it's twelve below. Just be prepared for the winter. And here is a good thought. A full, well-developed human being will find a way to take advantage of the winter, not just handle it. The big challenge is to make something out of each opportunity. Now, if winters are always going to occur in our life, shouldn't we benefit from them, too? Come the next winter, you could be on the inside looking out, seated by a warm fire, the company of a good friend, and those unique feelings of security in spite of the circumstances or the season. Begin to know now that the night will pass, and as you learn to grow and progress, you will better understand how to handle every night and better live every day. Here's some of the best advice I have on worry. First, don't be afraid to face the facts of life. It is not negative to understand that the winters always come. Don't be faked out. Don't clip the word impossible out of the dictionary. Sure, the Bible says all things are possible, but I don't really understand all that means. My daughters ask me, have you ever tried putting toothpaste back in the tube? Don't say I don't want to hear the problem. I don't want to see the difficulty. Don't show me the weeds. Don't say anything negative. Only see the positive. That's foolish. There is a thin line between positive thinking and kidding yourself. And remember, there's also a thin line between faith and folly. Here is the key. Humans have the unique ability to see it as it is. And they also have the ability to see it better than it is. One is called fact, the other is called faith. Faith you develop, facts you acquire. The facts you acquire are essential. It's like belief. You constantly must find facts to support your belief. Faith says, I will move mountains. It doesn't say, I will move mountains if someone gives me a bulldozer. I'll move a mountain if they will build me a road up there, if the weather's nice, if they give me a shovel. Faith just says, I will move mountains. Faith doesn't ask for a result to prove its existence. Faith is because it is. And remember, people die for faith. And some people give up everything they own, their life, for faith. Many years ago, over in Vietnam, a Buddhist monk did a very clever thing. He did the ultimate in political dissent. He burned himself to death. That toppled the government. That was faith. 
totality begets totality. Here is a good prayer. Help me to see it as it is, and help me to see it better than it is, and then inspire me to act. Facts and faith and action. What a combination for personal progress. And action puts fear to flight. An Old Testament phrase says, Watch the ants, you sluggard. Consider their ways and be wise. Not a bad suggestion. The study of ants. What do they do in the summer to prepare for the winter? That's a lesson in life and survival. Happiness, wealth, peace, security, success, safety, friendship, reward, results, and all human achievement comes from a growing ability to understand and handle the changing seasons. And so we come right back to the theme of our entire enterprise, self-development. Learn to work harder on yourself than anything else. The key to all success in economics or mental health is self-development. It will all change for the better when you change for the better. It's what you become that really counts. And you are the only variable. So a good statement is, you can't be all positive. You can't be all confident. You can't be all faith. But confidence and faith and courage and inspiration can dominate worry and fear. Physical and emotional forces are always at work, and something will win and conquer. Make sure you give yourself the best chance to get mental and emotional domination over all of your challenges. And here is one of the master keys to the good life. Developing the intelligence and accepting the challenge of putting all of your emotional experience into their rightful ratio. Beginning this progress can bring about the most dramatic changes. You see, disappointment is like winter. It always comes. It is foolish to say, don't be disappointed. But you must learn to discipline your disappointment. If it dominates 51% of your time, you're in trouble. Continued heavy disappointment is like 12 months of winter. And 12 months of winter leaves very little alive. Use the guidelines of seasons to adjust to all the meaningful things that happen to you. So concern, fear, and disappointment, like many human emotions, serve a useful purpose as long as they are kept in their rightful ratio. Left unattended, the weeds take over. Disappointment rules. Worry breaks loose. Fear gets the upper hand. And doubt moves in. But managed worked, given human action with will and knowledge and purpose, and gardens overcome weeds, faith overcomes doubt, and confidence pushes worry into a small place. The second major key to mastering worry is to respond. Build up inside of you that heavy desire to be free, to get on with building your life and lifestyle. Too much is waiting to delay. Take a new look at your opportunities. Figure out new ways to seize them immediately and make them work for you. And here is a key. Bring a new dedication that you will master yourself with enough discipline to be more than qualified to do the present job and prepare yourself for the next move up. Expose yourself to every stimulation possible that will put all this in perspective. Now let's move on to a very important point, and that is the best answer to worry is confidence. First, self-confidence. I can better handle next winter. I have a strong shelter. It is stocked with supplies. I now know how to take advantage of the spring. I'm going to plant better crops and bigger crops. I can last through the summer. I won't quit this time. I'll study weeds and how to get rid of them. I'll be less frightened of the changing weather and the quick storms. In the fall, I will exercise more care and reap what I have without complaint and blame nothing for the amount of my harvest. 
I'll learn to save a fair portion so that I can survive the bad seasons when out of control the hailstorm comes and it all goes wrong. Now we must consider this. The most fatal deterrent to self-confidence is guilt. Not doing all you know how to do to the full extent of your present ability weakens the foundation for confidence. The biggest part of worry comes from the lack of this personal confidence. And lack of confidence comes from two major things. First, no goals or plans. And second, no daily discipline to achieve. The inaction to cure or handle small tasks is what starts the guilt process. And that always tends to make you look at what's wrong and expect the worst. So listen to the voices of creative experience. Let nature, experience, wisdom, books, everything speak to you and teach you. Remember, both opportunity and challenge await action. Everything yields to diligence. 